go with that uh, after I finish because this is the kind of last one and I can talk to this for a good number of minutes. Uh, I put this one last because it's kind of a general question. Uh, hi, I don't have any specific questions, but love some discussion about making session needs. I've only made a few and like some ideas. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by a few ideas as far as like flavor combinations or whatnot. Um, for us commercially, uh, we tend to make, I've, I've dabbled, but we haven't done on full scale, adding things in primary. Almost all the things at Meridian High that we do that are cork bottles, uh, I tend to use individually quick frozen fruit where I can and very little concentrate up front, maybe on a rare case of like black currant where I just want to make some juice and we don't have whole fruit available readily. Uh, I'll reconstitute some concentrate to make juice, but I don't like put a large amount of concentrate in there to get really, really heavy duty fruit flavors. You could do that. Uh, go to the homebrew store and buy some concentrate stuff and uh, using that up front. Otherwise, you're, you could just make it traditional. Uh, typically, if you want about a 7% thing, you're going to start off a specific gravity somewhere around 1040 to 1050 and let it go dry, you would probably add things like uh, nutrients in there. Uh, you would go through the standard degassing, adding oxygen kind of thing. Um, commercially, we add findings. I hear a lot of people, mm, you know, let it do its thing, grab it as your friend, you're gonna lose a whole lot of flavor by finding it. Uh, we've won a lot of awards and we use findings pretty regularly. Uh, there's different ones you can use. Bentonite's a clay that you have to let swell for 24 hours so it makes a slurry and use it. We don't use that because it's pretty messy and hard to dispose of. Uh, that is, a, I think, a, a positive charge finding. We use Sparkaloid, which is a commercial product from Scott Labs. That stuff works great if you don't have any fruit in it. It's just straight honey. You just get your mead cold and you boil the appropriate amount of sparkloid, pour it and while it's like basically pulled off the burner while it's still like just settling down from boiling and you throw that in your cold mead, stir it up, you start seeing a lot of sedimentation happen within three hours and in about 18 to 24 hours, uh, you will see a significant uh, decrease in cloudiness to the point that um, we go through a filtration process at that point and you can filter it pretty easily and not have too many problems. Otherwise, you're going to be waiting for quite some time to let the yeast drop out so that you're able to stabilize with sorbates and sulfites and uh, add anything additional to it. You, you know, what else can I say about making session needs? Um, there's a, you know, back sweeten appropriately. For session needs, I've kind of dialed a lot of my stuff in to be in the same range of drinkable beers. So nothing overly bone dry and nothing really overly sweet. So I'm kind of going between the ranges one might find for a Saison, which you typically don't see a whole lot, or a sour beer typically. 10, uh, 1.002, maybe 1.00. That's kind of still too dry for me. Uh, 1.002 might be the lower, lower end. So I'm always going to back sweeten uh, to some degree. Almost always uh, our, our traditionals, if I'm letting it go dry, you're going to end up somewhere between 0.994 and 0.998. So I'm always going to add something to it. I don't, I don't think bone, bone, bone dry mead is that palatable. It's just it's kind of really insipid. There's no kind of structure to it. And usually the alcohol shines up way too much. Uh, the acid is, if you add acid or tannins to it, it just kind of showcases itself and there's not a whole lot of body, even though you have some structure from tannins. So you're gonna add some sweetness to it. If you go too sweet, it can easily get too cloying. And so, you know, you kind of have to do your own judgment by taking commercial examples and go finding beers you like out there or ciders and, and, Take some, and when you, when you drink some, let it let one of them set out, 100 milliliters set out for a while so it degasses itself or stir it up or put it in a stir plate or something, get all the gas out of there, and put it in a hydrometer and see uh, what the specific gravity is at the end. Uh, we play kind of a game uh, at uh, with our production crew where I'll go get commercial examples of either meads or ones that I find with either particularly 
with good balance or ones without good balance. And I'll go around and take notes about, I'll do tartaric acid, uh, titratable acid uh, experiments on and have people guess just so they get better with the palate. And I'll put them in mixed orders and, um, you know, we do that with bench trials as well. But uh, just trying to get people's palate. Like, how sweet do you think this is? Can you gauge uh, where your sweetness level is? Is the acidity high enough to balance the sweetness? Uh, like, one I know particularly off the top of my head, uh, I think it's Smith and Forge is a cider. You would be amazed how high the residual sugar is in that. Uh, I was simply amazed. It did not taste like it. So I was, I was quite impressed with the balance on that. But when I put it in a specific, uh, when I put it in a hydrometer, I was like, wow, it's really that sweet. I, I really couldn't believe it. Uh, so it's kind of a good, interesting thing as far as what you want to dial your own session meat into. Uh, profiles. Uh, what do you want to make into a session meat? Uh, you can pretty much make the gamut of what's available in the competition. So you're going to have your traditionals, anywhere from dry, semi-sweet to sweet. You could do straight mellow mellows. Uh, or fruit meads, you can do, you know, ones with grapes, uh, wine grapes, or just table grapes. You can do one with apple cider. You can do it with the berries, mixture of berries. You can do it with stone fruit, like cherries, peaches, nectarines, mangoes. Uh, and then there's a whole slew of other ones, like coconut, um, you know, prickly pear. There's a other wild, you know, there's cactus fruit, things on that line that would kind of fall into other. You can do combinations of fruits and spices. Um, you know, and everybody has their whole thing. You know, I take a, I take a lot of examples by looking at confectionaries. I look at stuff from uh, uh, barbecue sauces, things that you know, savory and sweet things that go together. Um, I'd say seventy-five to eighty percent of my concoctions kind of come off as a, a reasonable pilot. I tend to start off my pilots with a one gallon. I've got access to quite a bit of honey, so. Uh, when I do it, the first one is using just a, uh, a one gallon batch and I'll just look for flavor profiles that I think match up like, you know, two pounds of fruit per gallon of this kind of fruit and uh, this many grams per gallon of a spice and kind of mix them all together. And uh, I might even discard, you know, let it ferment. Sometimes I'll just do it first. I'll take a traditional, I'll just add stuff to it. I'll go, I like this flavor profile. I might just start it from scratch. For me, a gallon is, we have production losses that far exceed a gallon, so it's not really that big a deal for me. Uh, but for you, you might find it um, being a little bit overwhelming and expensive. Uh, then from that point, I might do one or two one-gallon batches and move up to a five-gallon batch, uh, especially if it's the primary set of things because uh, fermentation in one-gallon carboys versus fermentation in five-gallon carboys, I do notice uh, a substantial difference in flavor, especially aging them in there. I tend to get this rubber stopper thing, no matter if I'm using universal corks or uh, the rubber stoppers with the uh, rubber bungs on there. I always, if I age it more than three months, I always tend to get this tinge of rubber or almost like the car tire rubber uh, that tends to come off. I don't know if it's an oxidation thing, but as soon as I make the same thing in a, in a three or five gallon carboy, I really don't notice the same thing. So I don't know if it has to do with the surface area. And I try to keep my you know, the levels topped up pretty well. Um, uh, but that's a way to do some piloting of, of things. Uh, where else do I draw inspiration from? Um, sometimes just reading recipes online. You'll find a lot of people make these uh, concoctions that don't really follow through with telling you how well it is. You might, let's say you have a mango habanero and you heard that you want to make a mango habanero one. There's no necessarily proven recipe unless you go into like got need the, the patron section, maybe some homebrew talk stuff. You might go out there, but a lot of times people have some discussion about it, but the original poster will never come back and give you feedback about what it is. And occasionally you'll have somebody. So you might just take a couple of them, what people stabbed at and go, all right, this guy has three pounds per gallon. This person has one and a half pounds per gallon. You might have one or two commenters that say, Hey, this was too much. And so you just kind of throw things together. You got to have a starting point somewhere. Uh, and after doing a good number of batches, uh, you start having a good gut feel. Uh, I can't say enough good things about the patron session. It's worth $25. Uh, got me. There's a lot of good information on there. Uh, for 25 bucks a year, it's just a, a very worthwhile. There's some really good proven recipes in there. Uh, 
uh, and some good tidbits. Uh, I know people cool who goes by Oscar on there has a, uh, some old stuff from the Mead Digest to talk about, you know, how much spice is too much uh, for certain things, you know, don't exceed two 